the past, Clinton County, Missouri was the western edge of the United States. Situated between two emerging cities, Kansas City and St. Joseph, Clinton County benefited from their growth. The Pony Express, the Gold Rush, and Western Migration brought people through the county, but the population that settled here put it on the map. Plattsburgh became the beef capital of the world. Lathrop was the major supplier of mules for the Boer Wars and World War I. Five railroads crisscrossed the county, and the nation's first north-south highway ran through Cameron, Plattsburgh, and Trimble on its way to Kansas City. Clinton County was home to David Rice Atchison, president for a day, James Harvey Birch, Missouri Supreme Court judge, Willis J. Wynn, president of the Cleveland Federal Reserve, and James Marshall, early leader of the Manhattan Project. Here are more family histories of Clinton County. My name is Alvin Fry from Plattsburgh, Missouri. Appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about my family here in Clinton County. My family gets a start in this new world in 1685 by a man by the name of Heinrich Fry, Germantown, Pennsylvania. I am a direct descendant of that individual I am part of the Heinrich Fry Family Association, and so our connections go back to about 100 years before the Revolutionary War, where it was a German-speaking French and Swiss citizen came over. And they spent some time in Pennsylvania. The next generation so moves down into Virginia. There is a place in Virginia called the Fry Fort. The next generation after that, after Heinrich, builds a stone house. I was there the first time, took my parents there in 1971. I took my two oldest children there in 1986 to visit the Fry Fort. My family started leaving Virginia about 1800, moving out to Kentucky during that period of time. So my family leaves Kentucky somewhere in that period of time, it spends about 20 years in Kentucky. I'm not sure exactly why they went to Kentucky. I did not know why they went to Missouri. But they came out of here, first of all, the, uh, the one that really led the way coming to this part of the country was a Solomon Fry. And if you search the history of Clinton County and Clay County, he comes through with high marks and colors. He's a, quite a civic-minded individual, built bridges, built jails, uh, was quite a successful farmer in his day. He is a great, great uncle to me. So I'm, a, I'm a, to the line to the side of it is, his father is my great, great, great grandfather, Isaac Fry. Solomon and Isaac are both buried out on the McCulloch Farm in that Fry Cemetery there that was actually Benjamin Fry Farm at one time. We have about 12 or 13 Fry's in that little cemetery uh, where Beverly McCulloch takes care of. So my family started coming out here after Solomon kind of led the way in about 1820. Eventually he goes back to Vincennes, Indiana and marries a Susan Snap and she becomes his wife and they live here for the rest of their life and raised a pretty good sized family. Right now I don't have their names on my memory list but there's Abraham Snap and this, she's a descendant of Snap so there's Snap in the family. Uh, eventually, in the 30s, we had a mayor here in uh, Plattsburgh, Albert Preston Brick Fry. He's well known in his day, and he is a direct descendant of Solomon Fry, I guess probably a grandson. So during the 1820s, my family, different ones and different times came. My great-great-great-grandfather came in about 1827, and uh, he was the oldest one to come out of here. And uh, his son, my great-great-grandfather, actually goes back to Kentucky. There's a family split. And so Isaac James, my great-great-grandfather, goes back to Kentucky. And then his son, William, is born here, but he grows up in Kentucky, and so he comes back. So my family comes back with my William Fry 
and he's married to a Mary Ann Cross, and they have a small family. Eventually, William Fry, my great grandfather, was involved in the Fry and Eaton Livery Stable, which is a community courtyard. We have been told that he ran a freight line from Plattsburgh to Osborne Junction and from Plattsburgh to St. Joe. We were told that a trip to St. Joe would be a day up and a day back on a freight line with horse and team, team, team and wagon. And so he had a small family compared to what comes later on. He had a son, Walter, my grandfather. My grandfather, Walter, was born in Kentucky in 1852. He was born eight years before the Civil War. He died in 1912. My dad was five years old when he lost his dad. I miss my grandfather about a half a century. He was born before the uh, uh, First World War. He did have a son to go into the war, Ray Fry. Ray came back and uh, farmed and uh, was a war one then. Did quite well in the, in the war, made corporal, and uh, was part of the occupying force. Ray Fry. One of eight brothers, my dad was the youngest of the family. In this period of time, there were several of the Fry boys that operated different businesses. One of them was Thomas Jefferson Fry. He was a very successful Watkins product salesman, well known in the territory, quite a salesman in his day, I guess. He insisted that you buy. And uh, he lived down in Clay Avenue was there for about 60 years and uh, had four daughters. One of them survives today. Geraldine lives in Savannah. She's 86 years old. Most of my first cousins and I had almost 20 here at one time with all the family seemed like I had a lot of girls. I had over 20 first cousins in this area, Plattsburgh, Lathrop, around. Most of them women, so they moved on to the families and moved on. I was part of the group that was the youngest of all that first cousin line. And uh, by the way, there was quite a line of cancer in those women. And some of the men, we had a heavy, heavy share of cancer by those, those women in that, in, in that time. Another brother was George Fry. He had the George Fry hardware. I think that name is still over there somewhere. He had the Farm Wall International Agency. My dad ran the welding shop for him, which was Carter's, which is now gone completely. And uh, ran, my dad ran the welding shop, machine shop. And some of the others, Bill Fry, uh, farmed and was a successful carpenter around town, built several things in his day. Uh, Ray Fry farmed over on the other side of Lathrop. And most of them were in this area and a pretty good sized family. Now they're pretty well all gone. Most of my family is either deceased or live someplace else. And so I've done a lot of research over the years to become part of that association, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, so I've had time for preparation. I can find out a lot of the, the, the different ones that are related. And uh, I guess that's about all I've got on, unless I want to go into any small stories I told the other day, I told one story, one story about Heinrich, excuse me, Isaac and Catherine, my great, great, great grandparents, had about 11 children. One of them was a daughter named Eleanor, Eleanor Fry, and she marries James Hyatt McGee. And that is the start of the McGee family of Kansas City, Missouri, which much is named after the McGee Street. Eventually, James Hyde McGee owned just about all what is downtown Kansas City today. And before, before Kansas City really became a town, a city, it was farmland belonged by this James Hyde McGee. And their mother was Eleanor uh, McGee and, uh, of course, Eleanor Fry McGee. She was called Nellie. She became quite well known in her day for being a woman that knew how to take care of things when people were sick. And there is a story that floats around when discussing Nellie that uh, 
during one time she needed to make a house call. She had to cross a swollen little creek running pretty wild. She had to pull her feet up close to get across without getting soaked. And she crossed this little stream that was flooding to go get somebody to give him some help. And she became really quite a woman in her day, very knowledgeable where she got her training, her education, I really don't know. But she became very knowledgeable in helping people with uh, family health issues. The, uh, the individual has given credit for riding the Pony Express out of the bar down to the boat to get across the river with Johnny Fry. Now he is not of our line, he is a separate line. And uh, I think he grew up over there around Rushville and eventually moved to, uh, to San Joe. And I would say he probably wasn't a real big guy. Most of the fries in her earlier time was about five, six, five, eight, warrior little guys, very strong. And uh, probably just the right size to make a good rider for the uh, Pony Express. And so it is, uh, uh, I've been to the museum up there, the Heinrich Fry Association went up there in uh, 2013, I think, and uh, got their presentation. And uh, so Johnny Fry rode west with the Pony Express, and then eventually he would be the first one back as he made the return trip when, when the material was available to come back. And so, uh, he was born in about 1840. The Pony Express goes off about 1860, 61. He was in the Civil War. He was killed by the Southern, he was, a, he was a Northerner. He was killed by the Southern forces in Baxter Springs, Kansas. And so he lives to about, he made it to about 23 years of age. Anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> Any other good stories you have? Beg your pardon? Any other good stories you have? I can't think of it right now. I know you have them. Anything about the, you know, have any stories about the trains here in Plattsburgh? The trains? Yeah. I do have a story. <laughs> uh -uh. At a time, about 42, 44. With my family, we lived over there behind where the, uh, the business, or like where the city hall is. There was a house there up on top of that bank above the railroad. We, we lived in that little old house for a while. And early one morning, there was some kind of commotion. So we left the house and came over here to the bottom of this hill right here. One of the gardener trucks had been parked back here by the uh, community courtyard. That's where the, that was a garage. That was a garage for a long time. They had parked the truck and left it in neutral and it coasted down that hill, not very much of a hill, coasted down, came by here and ran into that house down there on the corner. Ed Goosey was asleep in the house to when it hit the, hit the wall, knocked the plaster. My dad said he come out, he had plaster on his hair and woke him up, Ed Goosey came out and I remember going down and seeing it and looking at the headlight on the truck on the front fender was an international and the headlight was turned. And I was telling my dad about the, the headlight being turned and his brother George heard it and thought that was just so funny that the little kid was talking about a headlight being turned that hit the house. That was about 1944. Just a little, just a little boy, four years old. And those houses down there sit right next to the railroad track and uh, really, I don't know too much about the, the, the rail, but it, uh, it did bring a lot of products, produce to the town. It brought coal, it brought lumber, and they would park the train cars up by the depot and unload them when they had a chance. And so that was a thriving deal for the community. And about 74 or whatever it was, that's about when they closed the train down. I really hated to see that, but we were moving from rail to highway. We worked, uh, worked away from the house as a, uh, most of the time as an aircraft mechanic. I put 35 and a half years in a TWA. Yeah, I got out of high school, I went to work at Corn Products. 
kind of waited around for the draft. He was going to basically get me. I really didn't want to be drafted into the Army. And I heard that the Navy had some pretty good schools, probably not better than anybody else, but I heard they were pretty good. So I went to San Joe to the recruiting office at the courthouse and uh, asked about getting a school. And they said, well, if you sign up now, I don't know if they have a time limit or not, they didn't say that. If you sign up, we can guarantee you a school. We don't know which one it'll be, but we can guarantee you. So I went in the Navy as a seaman recruit HS. Seaman SR, SRHS, seaman recruit high school. So I had no idea what school I wanted to do until I got in boot camp and started looking at some of the things. And I decided on aviation. I'm sure glad I did that. I was thinking about being a machine repairman or machinist mate in the, the heavy black shoe Navy when I ended up in what they called the brown shoe Navy. That's aviation. And so I got out of boot camp, was sent to Memphis, started the school down there, the different ones, different parts of it, two weeks here, four weeks here. And then I chose aviation machines made jet. I made that choice to do it, be a jet engine mechanic. So I finished the school, did a lot better in those schools than I did in high school here. It was in an area that I was more comfortable with and it came easy for me. And uh, so I got out of A school at Memphis Went down to uh, Cecil Field, Jacksonville, Florida, being trained on the F-8 Crusader and finished up that school. Uh, got in transit, crossed the equator, excuse me, crossed the Atlantic in a chartered capital G, Super G Connie, 16 hours across the Atlantic and got to French, French Morocco, Port Lyoti, French Morocco, was there for a week. All I got to do was work in the laundry. They let me do that. And uh, so after a week, uh, they had a, uh, a C-130 cargo transport airplane taking a small load over to Rhodes, Greece. So we got aboard the, uh, the, the Hercules C-130 for about six or seven hours flew across the Mediterranean and landed on the island of Rhodes, Greece. The significant thing about that in the old world, of the seven great wonders of the old world, Rhodes, Greece had the Colossus of Rhodes, tall bronze statue, but an earthquake, seismic activity brought it down. But that was a place in the old world where the Colossus of Rhodes stood. And so I went aboard ship and uh, I was there 15 minutes and ran into a guy from Gower. <laughs> he could not believe it that I was there. I knew him from over at Gower, Donald Clark. He was married to a girl from Blacksburg. And uh, so a minute to, he was just absolutely blown away when he saw me when I hollered at him. And uh, his name was Donald Ray Clark and he went by the nickname of Dewey. And so I hollered, hey Dewey, and he knew he was in trouble because there was nobody there that knew that name. And so eventually I had him come up. When I became a plane captain on the Crusader, I was able to take him up, get him in the cockpit, show him around the uh, instrument panel, how we get them all set up and everything. And so I became a plane captain. And if you don't know what that means, that means that you're a mother to a baby and the baby is an airplane. If it moves, you better be with it and ready to go. You, you got to monitor that thing. When they sound off flight quarters in the morning about 6 a.m., you'd best be on your airplane ready to go because if they get, they get ready to move it and you ain't there, it won't be good. And so they throw the chains on it and move the airplane tied back down. And uh, it's a lot of work. But I was a uh, certified plane captain out of 174 and uh, become a plane captain on the uh, Enterprise. That was my first men cruise. So I ended up with being on three med cruises, around the world cruise, and a Westpac cruise in my four years and 33 days. And uh, so when I got out, after a little schooling, I went ahead and uh, 
applied for a mechanic job at TWA and eventually was hired on. And like I said, I spent 35 and a half years and uh, I've been gone about uh, 17 years now. It's been quite a retirement. The Fry family farm was originally purchased by my great-grandfather, William Fry. And I believe that is uh, sometime in August uh, 1881. As I mentioned earlier, he was part of the, the Fry Liberty Stable, the community courtyard. I think he had a freight line. He was also a carpenter. He's buried in the old cemetery. And uh, so he bought that farm, a little over 100 acres. It varied some. And uh, so that's where he started having his family live and raised in. So then he dies in 1902. And then he gives it to two sons and they split it up. Then my grandfather, Walter Fry, uh, 1852 to 1912, becomes the owner of it, raising his boys that he had. He had eight boys one girl at the end of the family. And uh, so William dies, it passes on to Walter. Walter dies in 1912. Then he comes, becomes kind of deal where everybody wants their share of the farm. Some of them try to farm it. Eventually it sells in about 1926 to 30. My grandma Grandma Fry, Josephine Elizabeth Kelly, lives down on Locust Avenue, Locust Street. She lives there until 1949 when she dies living at that place. And so the family split up and, and the family farm was sold. Of course, today I really hate that, that that wasn't passed down, but it's, it, uh, it stayed kind of in the family for a while. Um, different boys kind of farmed it like Ray Fry did. And basically it sells to Arch Shaver and then his son Charles, Charlie Shaver, he farms it. Charlie Shaver is married to my first cousin Lucille and they farm it, run a dairy operation for a long time till their, their children got out of that, uh, out of school and then eventually uh, Charlie and Lucille sell that place, buy a little piece of acres down the road. And it's a place to work uh, that J.W. Lyle lived in the house that he was living in is the house that my family built in 1918. They built a new house in 1918. And of course it became known as the Shaver Place after a certain amount of time. In the earlier days, like in the 50s, there used to be family reunions there at the old Fry Place, although it was under the ownership of Arch, Arch Haver. And uh, so the Solomon Fry Place uh, is down there on the old, uh, what highway? J. J on J Highway. Uh, there's a brick house. There was a captain that lived by it, next by it, next door by it. He owned it and he tore it up. Just tore it down one time. I was coming home from work, went by it. And I just thought that was a terrible loss that this main civic minded man, Solomon Fry's house would be torn down and not somehow honored. So it seemed like that was a thing to happen. A lot of the old historical houses were removed and uh, so that was a Solomon Fry place. He had quite a few acres, pretty good sized family. Again, Solomon goes back to the very early family here and had a tremendous, well welcomed reputation. And uh, it reads that he was quite a character. So I imagine he was probably a real individual in his day. But he helped build the Liberty Jail, Clay County and built the first courthouse here. And uh, that was, it seemed like that many of my ancestors 
are well-done carpenters. They, they do very well. My dad was not a carpenter, but he was a good machinist. I, he had a brother in California. I got acquainted with him in the early 70s, and he would say, I couldn't beat old Charlie in the iron, but I could beat him in the wood. So apparently there was quite a bit of competition of who could do the best job in a period of time to where that really mattered. How, how well you could do your job. He wanted better than anybody else. I told Eric Carter one time that I'd had a structural failure, something my dad built. He said, that's a piece of history, that don't happen. <laughs> I said, that's right. 